Hi, everyone. We're here. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, can everyone hear and see us? Okay, first of all. I can hear you. Well, that's the most important thing. This is Posey. Do you all know Posey Parker? Well, I, I still call you Posey. I'm never going to switch on. over to Kelly J. Sorry. No, you carry on. It's fine. <laughs> How are you doing over there? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, It's been a victorious week in uh, Tursville in the UK. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So, yeah, went Tell a bit viral. <laughs> well, I went a bit viral on Mon Sunday because I had two police officers at my house. Um, they clearly weren't really here for what they said, but they, they used these words verbatim. Um, hear about one of your videos uh i said which one he said i don't i haven't seen it and then he said um <laughs> but you would be hear about one of your videos do you make videos <laughs> <laughs> well he said um you were being untoward about pedophiles and i was like mm, is it a crime to be untoward about pedophiles what does he said, that well, mean? Was offended. Well, what he meant was that i'd probably accuse somebody or something that i made some inference about somebody and paedophilia, I would think. Um, but it was, uh, it was it was just perfect. Untoward about paedophiles. I mean, I, he obviously hadn't rehearsed what he was going to say. So somebody complained to the cops and they were forced to go check on you or what? They volunteered yeah. to go check on you? No, they forced and they said a hate crime had been recorded, uh, which is another thing they got wrong. We used to record non-hate incidents um and you're it doesn't matter you know i could just make something up that i could say that you think i'm actually a muslim and you would said something derogatory about me and i'm pretty sure it was because i was a muslim even though i'm not a muslim i can still claim that you were being islamophobic and report you and you would get recorded and what does it mean when you get recorded what's the impact of that well, it could be that when you try for a job, um, that it comes up on a police check. Mm -hmm. It could be. Um, I don't really see what other reason they would keep it. But they don't keep, uh, I'm not charged or kept as, uh, there's no record of me committing a hate crime. Um, it would be a non-hate incident. But we've also had a recent ruling in the UK that they can't do that anymore. Because there are there are thousands of us on those databases. <laughs> Right. So what was it that you actually said? Do you know what was said that you that caused this complaint and police visit? Yes, I do. <laughs> I was um I did a video about Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's that kind of fringe right on the right side of and I mean politically, on the right side of um the Republicans. And she talked specifically about a drag queen story time incident in which this guy was acting pretty vile. And I think there was a there was a video of kids giving a drag queen money. And I don't even understand the whole concept of drag. I don't find it entertaining when a guy dances badly. I don't understand either. And I've been saying this for so long. Like my first the first, I, the first time I ever saw a drag show, I was like, this is bad. Like, yeah. you know, bad for like so many reasons. It wasn't entertaining. They weren't talented. I no. was really mad because the situation that I saw the show in, it was at a bar and they were kind of, they were doing, um, you know, like, like, uh, I sort of karaoke performances but planned it's mime, don't they? and and so there were women like young women and they were so much more talented than the drag queens and then the drag queens would come on and be much worse and everybody would go crazy and applaud so much for the drag queens and i was like this is fucking bullshit and of course they were being sexist and misogynistic but i was like I, and I've seen several shows since then, always accidental. I'm never purposely going to see drag shows. But, you know, they just sort of throw these things at you in all sorts of various scenarios. Like you're at some event and they're like, oh, drag, everybody loves drag. And I have never been able to understand what no. is entertaining about it. No. Well, also, it's really deeply misogynist. So the, the ruling for the ruling, the judging in RuPaul's Drag Race is 
charisma, C for charisma, U for uniqueness, N for nerve, and T for talent, which happily spells out C U N T. That's oh. you know, it's not a coincidence. And then women are called fish and all these other things. Anyway, but Marjorie Taylor Green had made a comment about how it was not appropriate for children. Um, and that she said it was grooming, and I agreed with her. And so somebody basically said that I uh, I do mention paedophiles. I can't remember specifically. But I do sort of say that who wants to um, erase the boundaries between adult sexuality and sexual acts and children? Well, paedophiles do. Um, other people are not so not so cavalier with safeguarding and boundaries between adults and children. And I do think a particular sort of man, not necessarily a man with kids, but there's a particular sort of man that doesn't recognize those boundaries or appreciate why they're so important. They might not be paedophiles, um, but I do think the act of blurring those boundaries is a, a paedophilic act. I think... I think you're correct. And I think that the other reason why there is a certain kind of man that doesn't recognize these kinds of boundaries is because we're dealing with narcissists and they don't give a shit about anything except yeah. for their own, you know, attention. And I think that there's probably like a high percentage, I'm not a psychologist, but there's probably like a high percentage of narcissists in this drag community of, of men who want attention for being completely untalented and for, you know, mocking women and behaving in misogynistic, hypersexualized ways. I mean, that sort of community is one of the first, I'm, I, who was it? It was Elton John was on uh, a chat show with Graham Norton and Elton John sort of used the pronoun she um, for Graham Norton. You know, these sort of men, mm -hmm. there's something nasty it always feels nasty about men when they uh, use women's language or dress as women. It's It never feels like it's a massive kind of, yay, go women. <laughs> That's so great. It always comes with this sort of nasty undercurrent of um, misogyny. Well, and it does sort of end up seeming between drag and the trans trend that as a society, we think men are much better at being women than women are. Well, they are so much better. Um, <laughs> they are so much. I mean, who could lip sync for a living? What woman <laughs> could do that? And the dancing. Have you ever seen the dancing? Because it's not dancing. It's just like there was one guy and all he kept doing was like just doing his arms like that. That was kind of that was <laughs> whole... That was the whole dance. You're very good at that. You should consider a career in drag. Well, you know, um, there are women that now do it, aren't there? Which I think is just the most ridiculous handmaidenly weirdness I've ever heard. You know what I think? I think that people who are really into drag are the kinds of people who, I mean, this is also my theory about chicks who get into burlesque is that you were sort of like a homely, shy, quiet, nerdy person. You maybe came from, often I feel like they came from like religious backgrounds. So their response when they become adults is to behave like rebellious teenagers. They're like, I hate everything that's, you know, considered prudish or Puritan. Um, and so I'm going to the other extreme. But I think they, they see drag and they're like, I'm embracing the gay community you know, I'm so progressive. I'm so open-minded. This is so wonderful and fun. And they're so bad. They're wearing women's clothing. Well, there's a thing with competitive mothers, right? Who have to talk about how, oh, my daughter's so amazing because she's gender non-conforming. Or my son's amazing because he's gender non-conforming. Yeah. And I just think, I don't care. I, yeah. it's, it's no, you know, if your child goes along with, say 70% of other girls and they're really madly into whatever other girls are into, then that is no great shame. That's no worse than um, or better or whatever than a girl that doesn't go along with any of those things. You know, what we hope is that our kids are happy. I don't care how any of my children achieve that, where they turn into a mad stereotype or whether they really go against the grain. But there is this weird thing that women sort of brag about how 
oh, you know, my daughter doesn't like pink. Or, mm. um, I mean, my daughter doesn't like pink. Uh, you know, she's 15. So it's just, there's something about that. Or my son, he doesn't mind wearing pink at all. And I think, oh, well done. Why don't you get yourself a rosette? Yeah. Well, who cares? It's just, it's that interesting. And I think that there's, I mean, it's a lot of, it's juvenile because it's attention seeking behavior. Um, you know, engaging in drag again, same thing with, we're not here to talk about burlesque, but I sort of see it as similar as like girls who get into burlesque. Like it's juvenile. Like, it's like, yeah. I want attention. Like I want men to think I'm sexy. And it's like, you know, men, think you're sexy because you're naked. They don't have that high standards. You know what I mean? Well, like, I for you. like people, I men call, are going to cheer for you if you get like naked in public. I call burlesque over here middle-class stripping because yeah. it's basically just a stripper. They just do it with better costumes, right? Well, and they do it, you know, voluntarily in that they don't need to do it. Like they're not doing it because they need to survive. I'm sure some of them get paid, but I think that a lot of burlesque is amateur and it's like oh that's nice that your burla your stripping is art because you're doing it for free and slowly because you talk about <laughs> so slowly and, and look um, at those costumes like and you got feathers oh my god yeah like uh, it's yeah. like there's still the only reason that people are there is because they're girls getting naked on stage yes yeah. Although women will watch burlesque and sort of as if it's some sort of weird sexual empowerment for women to be able to say, oh, that woman's so attractive. Uh, yeah. Look, I I'm unashamed in my definite envy of other women. I don't, I've never felt it uh, necessary to talk about how beautiful and attractive and what a gorgeous, sexy body any other woman has ever had. Isn't that a weird thing to do? Like, isn't that like, why? Like, I'm heterosexual. I don't care about other women's bodies. And so many women almost, like, I don't even know if they think about it. They just knee jerk, like, oh, look at her beautiful. Well, I mean, you know, like, you got to love Jayla. She looks great. And I'm like, who cares? Like, yeah. Good for you. You look great. Like, who cares? I don't care. As long as my husband's not looking at any of these women. Uh, right. they go and go on their merry way and that's yeah. fine because yeah. I'm not okay with that either I find that weird when someone goes oh my husband he loves Pamela Anderson you're like why I'm do not you okay know? with it either no why do you know I wish that more women would like be hard asses about this like I don't think it's acceptable for your partner to watch pornography I don't think it's acceptable for your partner to go around looking at other women or like talking about other women's bodies. I don't think it's acceptable for your partner to be like looking at like sexy chicks on Instagram. Like it's totally disrespectful. Like, yeah. and people, include men and women alike, will be like, oh, but that's, you know, men think that is just a fantasy. And it's like, that's fine. Then they can keep it in their heads. Like, don't do that in public. Yeah. That's rude. <laughs> like what's in your I can't control what's in your head so go for it yeah right <laughs> I mean, look uh, if if somebody finds someone attractive that's uh, I don't think there's much you can do about it but I don't need to know thanks I don't no. know I mean I would I say, no. like would would I ever you know like I don't feel the need to go around looking I mean I wouldn't really do this anyway but like yeah. looking at other men in public or like talking to my partner about like how hot some got, like, why would I do that? What's the purpose of that? Like if I really needed to do that, which I don't think I do, I can talk to my friends about it. I don't need to like advertise it to my partner. Yeah. Um, and I think I was actually, I was just listening to part of a, a podcast today and it's like a, it's a relationship advice podcast and sort of a sex advice podcast um and I just listened to a clip of it because it came up on my phone and I wanted to know what they said but it was talking about men following um you know strange women on Instagram like this woman had written in and said my partner follows all these 
women that, you know, like, I guess were from before we met, like women that he was trying to hit on or trying to date, or he liked looking at their photos or whatever, and we're getting married and I want him to unfollow all these women. And in my brain, I'm like, of course you should. Um, and the people, the hosts of the podcast who were responding acted as though, I mean, the girl said, well, yeah, I think it's fair for him to unfollow these women because it's in public. And the guy was like, well, you know, like to men, everything's porn. And so like anything, like women have to understand that anything they see is porn. And like, it's sort of weird to like monitor your partner and be like, unfollow her, unfollow her, unfollow her, unfollow her. And I was like, and because they obviously accepted, they obviously accepted all men watch porn and that's just what men do. And it's just a fantasy and who cares? And I can't imagine, like, I understand men thinking that I suppose, cause they reinforce that to each other, but I can't understand women thinking that like, what, how could, how could you as a woman be comfortable with your partner watching pornography? It's just, I think we talked about this last time. <laughs> about I love this topic. <laughs> God, I love talking I, about pornography. Well, look, I I had this discussion where I was going to do this um, sort of essay thing. It was a long time ago with uh, a woman and she was quite a lot younger than me, but she was married to a man a lot older than me. Um, and I'm exactly the same age as my husband. And she just said stuff about, oh, because you're a feminist and women's rights and that's why you don't support porn. I was like, no, I just, my, I don't want my partner to be engaged in any sort of sexual activity uh, where there are other naked women. I think that's, you know, that's, that's it. Uh, yeah. It's not even anything else. It's just my absolute base level kind of protective territorial brain. That's, mm -hmm. That will govern that. But as for women giving relationship advice and sort of assuming that all men have to look at women all the time and it's perfectly natural and everybody should just not be jealous. No, I'm sorry, but I've been in a relationship a really long time. And if my husband wasn't a little bit jealous, if, if I was doing something or I wasn't jealous if he was doing something, I'd kind of think it was very weird. And yeah. It, it, I don't think you have to be insecure. I think you can just, I think you can be in a really settled, secure relationship and still worry about the prospect of somebody else taking the attention of your partner. When I don't even, I don't know that it's jealousy. Like to me, when, if I feel strongly about that kind of thing and how my partner behaves with or engages with other women, it's not because I'm, jealous like I'm worried that he's gonna like her more than me because I think that I'm better than all of these women naturally uh, <laughs> because I have a robust ego um but I just I really think it's disrespectful and I think that your partner should treat you with respect and I think that they shouldn't be entertaining the idea of sex acts with other women if they're in a monogamous partnership. Mm. Oh, it's just so gross. I mean, look, we're, I'm a lot older than you, but we're both too... Not that much. We're both too old for that sort of crap, right? Yeah. You no, know, it's just, no. Come on now. No, no, yeah. no. Yeah, I think that it's like, I think you sort of try to play along when you're younger. And then I think as you get older, as, I mean, this happens in all sorts of scenarios, you develop stronger boundaries and are more certain of your feelings and thoughts and beliefs. I hope, I hope would hope that for in any case, but okay, let's get back to the pedophiles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what, so what's happened now? So the police visited you and then. Well, then it went viral because untoward about pedophiles is quite a handy little something. So it went viral. Great. Um, and then the PCC, which is a politically elected um, police and crimes commissioner. So they're sort of politicians. So then he commented uh, about the local force. And then the chief of police uh, in this local area also commented, all to say everything had been dropped and it wasn't proportionate. Because, of course, Sunday afternoon, they come up to, they put up in my drive and my house is here and then I've got garages that are converted into offices and my daughter was in one of them and they demanded my daughter's name um, and and before they spoke to me, I didn't even know they were at the door, I would have recorded it otherwise. Um, so they spoke to me on Sunday, that went a bit viral, 
Um, today, as I understand it, a pensioner up north somewhere uh, posted uh, a repost of Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Fox post, which was the pride flag with the stupid trans thing um, as a Nazi flag. And I think he's sort of, you know, he's basically saying that that pride is is akin to fascism and it's a fascistic sort of totalitarian movement. Who posted it's this? Lawrence Fox. Okay. So do you know Lawrence Fox? No. I'm just going to try to look this up. It was on Twitter? Yeah. So there's a video of the arrest. So the police go, I think there's three police or four police turn up at this pensioner's house. And the idea is that someone's complained that it's homophobic. So they go to see him and arrest him. Harry Miller is there, who is the guy that took the Royal College of Policing to court about their guidance and about hate crime incidents. Because they came to his house to check his thinking. That's right. So now Harry's been arrested because Harry was telling the police that they weren't following PACE guidance, which is once you've... I think once you go to arrest someone, you have to caution them. So you have to say you have the right to remain silent, et cetera, and you have to tell them what crime they've committed. And as I understand it, they didn't do that with this pensioner. I mean, in cuffs. The pensioner is in cuffs for saying that, you know, for saying something homophobic, which I don't even think it's homophobic anyway. I think it's making a totally different comment. Um, but the police said it was homophobic. I mean, we have, as you well know, Megan, we have grooming gangs. Uh, we, well, let's call them rape, rape clubs. We have men who pass girls around in this country for the last four or five decades. And they have gone basically unchecked. Um, and people have ignored them because they don't want to be called racist because they're predominantly Pakistani Muslim men. So we have that where the police were turning a blind eye or arresting the fathers of the girls when they went to go and rescue their daughters from these rape dens. Mm -hmm. And we have that. And at the same time, we have police going to tell people off about Facebook. I mean, you just couldn't make it up. You will, within 50 miles probably of that house, there would have been a teenage girl who still is a victim of some rape club. Um, actually being brutalized as they're arresting this man on a Sunday, like nuts. So this is still, I mean, I, I heard about the grooming gangs, the story blew up what, maybe five years ago yeah. or something, finally. Um, and it, as you say, it had been going on for decades and the police had ignored this um, yeah. because they didn't want to appear to be racist. Um, and I was listening to Joe Rogan's interview with Francis Foster and Constantin Kissin today, wherein they mentioned how great you are and you are great. <laughs> um, and, and they brought up the grooming gangs in the UK and Rogan hadn't heard about them, which I was really surprised about because you know, that I guess that story really just blew up in the UK and it didn't reach North America. How could it not be kind of global news that we have allowed the rape of thousands upon thousands of girls? And even in some of the papers over here, and even amongst left the left-wing socialist feminists, um, and I'm not remotely including Julie Bindle in this because her work in this area is is well documented. Yeah, and she was a big part of that story blowing up. Like she pushed and pu she was one of the only ones who covered that story and she covered it Absolutely. a long time ago and she was ignored. Yeah. Other women who comment on stuff, <clears throat> they don't comment, they still don't comment on grooming gangs. Or if they do, they make some sort of caveat, I'm not racist, but. And I'm just thinking the rape of teenage girls, the mass rape of teenage girls in those numbers, um, I'm not making any caveats because what I'm telling you is serious enough that I can just talk about that issue. I don't need to tell any, I don't need to be worried about being accused of being racist because actually I'm just concerned about those girls. Um, so it's really good that uh, Constantine and Francis talked about that with Rogan because that will shine a bit more light. But you and I talked about this. Uh, when we first ever spoke 
And, and then someone tried to characterize the whole interview as something else. Um, but, you know, the vacuum was left by the left. The vacuum was left for other people to fill. That's what happened. And I think that also contributed to people not talking about it because it was then, you know, I don't know what the truth is about all the people involved in exposing the grooming gangs. I really, really don't know. And I don't think now that we know the accusation of racism was so prevalent, I think we have to be really careful about anything we believe around mm -hmm. anybody that's been uh, slandered or defamed um, or even accused. I, th I think it's really, really dangerous because it's a really big PR, very successful PR game that as soon as you can say racism, uh, you allow the green light for more and more rapes. Well, and so, yeah, and so many stories have turned out not to be true because the media and progressives chose a narrative that would either make the story appear to be about racism or yeah. where they disguise the truth of the story because they didn't want to appear racist themselves. And so what we learned from that, unfortunately, is that you're right, we can't trust any of these stories and we have to look into them ourselves as best we can. I mean, that, that I mean, a really basic example is what happened with that Karen dog park story what? where they characterized this woman as a horrible racist. And in fact, this man was like a horrible asshole and <laughs> nobody corrected the story. Like Barry Weiss looked into that story and reported on that story accurately. And I think she was probably the only one who did that. And this woman's yeah. life is probably still ruined. They took her freaking dog away. Yeah, it was weird. It was it was really, really weird. Um, you have super chats. Do you do your super yeah. chats? Yeah, so everyone, thank you for reminding me. Um, I cannot follow all of the comments in the live chat. I'm sorry. So if you have a question for Posey, please use the super chat. Um, and we have a question <clears throat> from Westy40 who says, this is not true. This is not, give me a fucking break. <laughs> Megan will run for the hills when I mention the name Matt Walsh. Yeah, I'm scared to talk about Matt Walsh. You're right. Um, sorry, I'm not trying to be rude, Westy 40, but like, give me a break. Like, first of all, I'm not scared to talk about anything. Second of all, I've talked about Matt Walsh lots of times on the internet and other places. Does Kelly also... Oh my God, this question is annoying me. Does Kelly also despise Walsh? If so, is it possible to put differences aside and work with religious conservatives for the greater good? I don't, I, I don't despise Walsh. I think he's an asshole and I think he's acting without integrity and I'm happy to talk about whatever. I'm, I would also be happy to talk about him, but he doesn't want to talk to the vast majority of women. But anyway, Kelly, you respond to the question. Well, look, he made a documentary. I'm glad he made it. I'm glad it reached an audience. Uh, every person that saw that documentary that was piqued by it, I'm absolutely delighted. Um, do have a little bit of an issue with Walsh because he shared a picture of me in one of my T-shirts in something like middle of June when he first brought out his documentary. And then his wife had this idea a couple of weeks after that photo was shared by him to do a dictionary definition of the woman, of the word woman t-shirt. <laughs> so where yeah. did, did, uh, did Matt Walsh say it was his wife's idea? Where did yeah. you hear that part? Oh, okay. I missed that. Oh uh, no, I haven't heard him say it. This is what I've heard. Oh, so let me be, let me be very clear, but they have started selling it's a substandard version, to be fair. Uh, but they have started selling um, a woman d dictionary definition of the word woman t-shirt. And I think that's, look, it's fine. He wants to make a documentary about an issue that I just think just is about women. The word woman, yeah. <laughs> it's about women. Yeah. He wants to do that. That's fine. He wants to reach an audience. That's absolutely great. Do I wish a woman had made the film? 100%. Uh, do I think it would have been a better film? Probably. Although I do like his dry delivery and I do like the way that he, um, like I've done, 
you draw these people out. You allow these people to speak, and the madness just um, speaks for itself. Yep. So, you know, in many ways, I'm delighted. I just wish a woman had made that film. I think it would have been a slightly different film as well. But he wasn't doing, he wasn't doing the fight. He was just saying, "Hey, everyone, look at this crazy stuff over here." Um, so, you know, I think the documentary was great. I think it was funny. I think it made a good point. I think he asked a lot of the same questions that I've asked and you've asked and other women have asked that point out the lunacy and the irrationality yeah. of this ideology and force people to try to answer questions that they can't answer. And that's revealing in itself in their struggle or their refusal to respond. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't even want to say I wish a woman made it because I think it would have been a whole different film if a woman made it. I hope that a woman does make a film about this. But I do think, I mean, I do think, first of all, that it's weird to make a film about the erasure of women while erasing women from this conversation and debate and while pretending that women haven't been fighting this fight for many years now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it wasn't, but it, it, fine, the documentary, fine, good, whatever. It's the way that he's been talking about this issue and the response and the documentary online, which is that he's been dissing women and feminists. He's been saying, you hurt the cause more than you help the cause, not you, but women and feminists. Um, and he claimed that he reached out to a bunch of big name feminists and they refused to talk to him. And like, maybe some big name feminists did that, but I feel like I know most of the women and the feminists involved in this fight, and I don't know that he reached out to any of them. He's obviously aware of you. I know that he's aware of me. Um, I think that he chose not to acknowledge feminists or women who have been fighting this fight before because he hates feminists and feminism. And because I think he is a self promoter and I, I, you know, like I know people who know him and I think he's, you know, he's making a lot of money off of this. Um, he's getting a lot of press over this. I think he wants to appear to be the only one brave enough to stand up, you know, five, six years after the fact, after we all, you know, were punished viciously for yeah. saying basic things like, you know, women are adult human females and trans women are men and all of those things that lots of women were brave enough to say years ago. Yeah. Um, and he, and because he wants to push a narrative which is that only the right wing and only conservative men are talking about this and pushing back and telling the truth about this, which is not true. But then I wonder, to be to be fair to him, I wonder if, um, I don't know, a left-wing feminist, uh, a Democrat voter in the United States made a film. I wonder if she'd have asked Matt Walsh or Ben Shapiro to comment. Probably yeah, that's not. a good point, actually, because <clears throat> obviously you or I would be happy to talk to Matt Walsh. I really like Ben Shapiro. I think he's great. I obviously don't agree with him about everything, but that doesn't no. mean that I don't like or respect a person. No. Um, but I think you're right that probably a lot of the so-called gender critical feminists who were mad about Matt Walsh's documentary and and his responses and his responses to jk rowling or whatever wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole no i mean look i've i've watched some of his stuff i quite like his dry delivery um i don't agree with much he says and and sometimes i do when i hear men talk about feminists even though i am not one but when i hear men talking about feminists i i often think we could just substitute that for women you know, uh -huh. there's just this weird undercurrent often when men really go after feminism uh, that I just hear women. And that's not always. Like Brendan O'Neill, I know, has comments to make about uh, modern feminism and, and other people. And you kind well, of... Well, Frances Foster, Constant and Kissin too. Like, I think that those two have a lot of integrity and I think that they probably have criticisms of feminism and they're certainly not misogynistic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I I get a different feeling from Matt Walsh. 
Yeah, but, I think yeah. so too. I mean, I also, I, I think that some of these people are lazy in their labeling of feminists because you could say like, oh, where are all the feminists or why are feminists doing this or feminists suck on this issue? But you're talking about a specific faction of feminists and either yeah. you're not aware of the other feminists or you don't really want to bother with the other feminists because they kind of do seem like they're in a minority. And to be fair, I find feminism and feminists extremely irritating and stupid most of the time. <laughs> so maybe that's fair. Like, Good job you're not selling something like, I don't know, something current, uh, woman current, <laughs> feminist current. I mean, I obviously am a fem I'm obviously invested in women's rights. Like that's, yeah. that's always what I've done. But feminism, the ideology, and the way that a lot of feminists behave, I think is... I think that a lot of them are not thinking things through. And I, oh, think I don't they're... know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. They've all been so lovely to me always. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I mean, they <laughs> they they dislike you so much that I got canceled just for not disliking you. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Whatever. So, I mean, that's quite weird. It's eye-opening, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I've just I'm so used to being on the outside and I really think actually, now that we're at this stage of the game in the UK, that the reason I have, I've really benefit from being on the outside, because it just meant that I could continue to do whatever I wanted without worrying about losing friends, because I'd already, <laughs> I'd already lost them all. I didn't have any to lose. Uh, when it came from sort of the movement, I wasn't answerable to anybody. So I could really, really stick to my own um, agenda and my own message, which hasn't really changed in all that time, and watch these women slowly have to admit that their message is not working quite so well. Well, and the message, when you're trying to force an entire ideology and you're saying you can't, you can't, like you can't accept my message unless you go along with all this other stuff, like that's not gonna work. Like. You know, you can't you can't challenge gender identity ideology and the trans trend unless you're also a socialist and unless you're also going to call yourself intersectional and anti-racist and unless you also hate Trump and unless you will only vote Democrat um, and so on and so forth. It's like, well, you're lo you're going to lose the fight there because I mean that will appeal to you know what. 1% less than 1% of the entire population. Definitely well, one, less than 1%. One of the very big names over here, um, who I won't name, called me and said, I think you should lay off some of the Trump stuff. And I was like, mm, no. Uh, I think it would be good optics. I was like, I I don't care. I What's the Trump stuff? Like you supporting Trump or what? Well, was I, I said if I had to fight... On the basis of this single issue, if I had to vote for Biden or Trump, I would have gone Trump. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, me too. Week. I mean, I said that also. Um, and I think for a range of other things, I think, I mean, look at, Jesus Christ, look at Biden. It's such a, I mean, he doesn't even look like he's alive anymore. I mean, maybe this is the transhumanist agenda. Maybe it's already got a lot further along than we imagined. But that man doesn't even look like he's inhabiting a body. It's peculiar. Um and he did, within the first sort of 100 days in office, he did obliterate women's rights. And I think that both men are monsters, right? I don't think either man is a, is the greatest man in the world. It's not somebody I would have liked to have for a father-in-law, either of those men, right? I think they're both monstrous. But But you're supposed to think that Trump is a monster and you're supposed to think that Biden is this really lovely, great, uh, benevolent man. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's insane. So anyway, so people said that and uh, all about these optics and everything. And I was like, look, I haven't got, I haven't occupied this particular space that I've carved for myself uh, through not saying what I think. And I think mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to do that. It's just, what's the point? People can hate me for it. I don't care, but I'm, I'm not going to shut up. Exactly. I mean, you're so right. Like I, I mean, I've gone through, something similar which is that you know for a long time what I said was you know 
I am independent. I don't answer any to anyone except the women's movement. And then at a certain point, I was like, well, I can't answer to the women's movement either because I have to tell the truth and I have to say what I think. And I built an audience by doing that. And it's my integrity and it's my work. And you can't bully me into repeating your mantras or doing what you tell me to do because that it's not it's not who I am and it's not what I want to do with, with my work but I mean so at a certain point you get you know canceled by everyone and then you are really free to say what you want and nobody calls you up anymore and tells you you know you really shouldn't say that or you can't talk about this or you have to say it in this way blah, 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 blah. and you know I don't people like it people trust it right so even if they don't agree with you like Ben Shapiro I don't agree with him on his whole pro-life. I've heard him say some things that I yeah, really, really don't agree with. Yeah. But when he speaks, I believe that he believes what he's saying. Yeah. And that makes it compelling. That makes him compelling and interesting to listen to. Um, so I'd rather take Ben Shapiro and listen to him talk pro-life all day long, which I absolutely fundamentally disagree with, mm -hmm. rather than listen to somebody say something I agree with, but that I know they don't really believe it. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's the problem with these ideologies and these people and these activists is that they talk and I don't believe them. You know, like, I don't think they're telling the truth. I think that they're repeating what they believe their analysis should be or what they think they should say. Um, I'm curious just because, you know, people say this a lot. People say, oh, like, Posey doesn't identify as a feminist anymore. And people say that about me all the time too. And I feel like they're misunderstanding and misrepresenting and it's frustrating because I'm trying to correct people, but also, you know, I'm not going to kill myself trying to correct people because people are going to say whatever they say. But is that true? Like, is there, was there at some point where you did identify as a feminist and then at some point where you said, I don't identify as a feminist anymore? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did. Um, when I started on this, so I, probably... So how old, my daughter is 15. So probably about 15 years ago, I started saying I'm a feminist. I started realizing that I should say it. Um, my opinions hadn't changed. I could just call it something. Uh, and I had given birth to a, a daughter and I already had two other kids. So your life sort of, some things that you didn't really get uh, about women, when you're a stay at home mother, you suddenly understand some of the things that, that women have been complaining about. Um, as opposed to when I was a worker and I was really successful um, in a predominantly male environment. And anyway, then I had kids and, and my life changed somewhat. And then after that lovely interview with you, Megan, uh, where I was massively uh, defamed by a very malignant woman, um, I or malevolent, I can't remember which is the uh, least horrible word. But she uh, she said that all these things about me and all these other women just kept saying all the time, oh, she's not a feminist, she dyes her hair. She's not a feminist, she's married. She's not a feminist, she stayed at home. And then the final sort of nail in the coffin, also Women's Place had to put this statement out about me saying that I was basically racist and um, Islamophobic because of my comments before about grooming gangs. And I just thought, okay, fine. You're going to say all that stuff about me. I won't be a feminist. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be measured by this uh, concept of feminism. And actually, when I went to America, and I did meet many women who are both on the left and the right, I wanted to appeal. I wanted my message to be able to reach as many people as possible. And by having a label like feminist, that was going to prevent some women accessing anything that I said and just dismiss me out of hand. So I thought it was far more powerful for what I wanted to achieve to not be a feminist. Um, and I will do the work of a women's rights campaigner and people can decide whether or not they believe that that is good enough for them. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, that's it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you. I agree with you. I think that ideology is really limiting in terms of our ability to think critically and make good choices about the kinds of policies we support and ideas we support and people that we learn from. You know, it prevented me for a long time from exploring ideas that were considered or called anti-feminist that turned out, many of which turned out to be really valuable, important ideas, including 
evolution and <laughs> differences <laughs> between men and women. <laughs> yes. Oh, and the anti-mother thing in some of the feminist uh, stuff just really, I get it. I understand why there was a movement to uh, free women from the shackles of motherhood, but actually um, I just think it's really impractical uh, and it doesn't work. And when I had my children, I could either put them into daycare or I could stay at home and look after them, which meant somebody was going to have to pay the bills. And it was either going to be the government or my husband, but it was going to be some sort of patriarchal bloody invention. Um, right. So it, even in that, I just, yeah, no. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't want to play that game either where women get to tell me constantly like, well, if you're a feminist, you have to think this. If you're a feminist, you have to say this. If you're a feminist, you have to believe this. And then eventually it's like, fine, then I'm not a feminist. Hmm. Stop haranguing me about this. <laughs> you can't have long hair. You can't wear your eyeliner. If you want to decide that I'm not a feminist because I say this or I talk to this person or I flirt with men or whatever, then okay, I won't be a feminist. Leave me alone. And I'm still going to keep doing what I think is right. I'm still going to keep defending women's rights. So. Hmm. Um, I want to get to some more questions because I know you don't want to hang out here forever because it's late for you there. Um, I don't totally understand this question, but hopefully you do from Genevieve. Um, I'm saying her name in French and I don't even know if she says that Genevieve or Genevieve. I, anyway, I recently learned from Women's Voices um, and she's involved in Redux. Um, I recently learned Pi founders moved to Amsterdam in 1984 I'm convinced history is repeating. Care to speak on this idea? Do you know what that's about? Oh, so Pi is the Pedophile Information Exchange, which was a very active group in the 70s and 80s in the UK. Um, so Peter Tatchell, the famous uh, gay rights campaigner, um, mm -hmm. has has skirted very close to the old pedophile wind um, and made some statements um, like he knows a man who, when he was nine, had a sexual relationship with an with a man or an older boy and that man that, that perfectly consented and was fine with it um so it, it, dodgy stuff right and what the pedophile information exchange managed to do is use um organizations like liberty so human rights campaign type groups uh, not like the american human rights campaign but um but sort of uh liberty groups um people genuinely concerned with human rights and the left and what they did is they managed to really get themselves very close to being accepted or acceptable so they they were interviewed on the bbc um they had freemasons they had people in positions of power the judiciary um the police uh lots of different uh in schools shaping policy etc and we sort of think that they went away. Well, clearly they didn't. Because if you have, if your urge, if your desire is to ar arrange your entire life about having access to raping children, then we're not going to get rid of those people. They are going to just find a different way to operate. And I would imagine they are absolutely gleeful about the safeguarding risks we have for children in the West. Uh, with LGBT, uh, because that is obliterating kids' boundaries. Um, so yes, mm -hmm. I think it's absolute, of course. Um, I This is just a question for me, because I want to get back to this drag queen story hour and the pedophilia <clears throat> thing again. I mean, I have sort of, it's obviously become very trendy in Canada, because Canada is a very progressive place. And so of course we should you know expose children to drag queens because that's open-minded and progressive um i mean I, I like i've talked to friends about it in vancouver they're probably the same kinds of people who would you know believe that trans women are women or at least claim to but they truly don't understand you know, like I've been like, you know, I guess if you want to do this, go ahead. I'm not going to try to stop you. But I think that parents have valid concerns. And I think that the people who are expressing concerns or protesting have valid concerns that should be listened to. But also, why? Why do you need to, you know, send your kid? Like, why can't the librarians read your kids' stories? They're good at that. 
Do you think it's just it's just virtue signaling, though, isn't it? it? I mean, we're supposed to pretend that we think drag is some is an actual identity, like it's no longer. And and it's what's it doing? It's persuading girls and boys that actually men can wear a crap ton of makeup and bad wigs. Like, I don't even understand it. Well, it's like all the sexist stuff, but when men do it, it's suddenly progressive or empowering somehow. Um, but I mean, it is, I think that it is fair to consider why these adult men are wanting to be, hey, sorry, give me a sec. Oh, <laughs> um, I'm at my friend's place using their internet. Um, why, uh, yeah, like, why do they need to be there? Like, why is it that, like, because it's obviously, like, this is a men's idea. I mean, I think initially it was actually a woman's idea who was really into, like, queer ideology or whatever. But it's obviously, like, the drag queens who are going into libraries and reading these stories are suggesting this and selling this to the libraries. Like, here, I have an idea. It's just, I just don't even, I don't even know where this all comes from we know that if a woman went into a library dressed like a drag queen um people would complain about her reading to kids i don't think i i just i don't know we have pantomime dames here i don't know if you know if you have that sort of tradition but we have a pantomime which is like a christmas show it'll be a fairy tale and often the lead boy was played by a woman and the lead woman or the old ugly woman was played by a man and that would be called the pantomime dame. Now, I personally always find them quite vile, grotesque parodies of women, um, but not sexualized. And so I wouldn't want them reading to my kids. It's just, I don't even get it. I think if you're if you're the sort of parent that takes your children to hear a story read by a drag queen, I think you're a moron. Okay. Um, Paula in the super chat says, I mean, we sort of went over this already, but I want to get to the super chats. I'm not on Twitter, but didn't Matt Walsh call out women for not speaking about this when you guys have been saying the same things for ages? I mean, yeah, I feel like he says that kind of thing all the time and that I've seen other right wing men say that too, this where are all the feminists, where are all the feminists and um you know, and he also said, you know, we spoke to anyone and everyone who was willing to sit down with us. That wasn't true. Um, I remain open to working with anyone who wants to stand against the trans thing, which also isn't true. You know, he even he even wouldn't work with some conservative women who tried to work with him, who I think, I think, I mean, I probably don't have this entirely right, but I think it was some of the women who were involved with the Heritage Foundation, or we're trying to like raise the alarm about this, we're trying to organize conversations about this. And I know that they reached out to Matt Walsh to try to get his support. Um, and he didn't get involved with them either. You know, it really, it, it's just the, the hypocrisy of it really, really, really bothers me that you're pretending to be talking about the erasure of women and you're totally intentionally and knowingly erasing women and, and dissing women because I don't think he respects women. That's what I think. I think he really doesn't respect women very much. Well, it, it's not difficult to, I mean, the, the Heritage Foundation, uh, that panel that Wolf did at the Heritage Foundation at the behest of parents, um, I don't think they're difficult to find. I don't, I don't think that was completely off his radar. I don't think it was completely off his radar. I mean, I, I did, um, I don't know when the movie was finished, but I went viral like three times this year before that movie was out. Um, one of them when I went to Atlanta and uh, shouted at Leah Thomas and had, you know, an, uh, the thing, I'm not a vet, but I know what a dog is. And I know Daily Wire shared that. And they also shared my conversation mm -hmm. with that horrible um, parody of woman, uh, Dawn Ellis. Um, NS. Might have missed that one. Did I? Which one was that? Oh, it was outside of a. It was in a swimming pool, um, and it was just outside of the where they all met in Atlanta. And I bumped into. In fact, I was with a few other women who were being really nice to this man in a dress, um, saying, "Oh, they'd had a really good thing." And I think they were sort of going, "Yeah, we've had a great time," and that was supposed to annoy him. And I just said, "Oh, look, um, I just want to ask you on the uh, for the." 
safety and dignity of girls and women. Do you use women's spaces? And he was like, I'm not here to talk about me. And I was like, do you use mm -hmm. women's spaces? I want okay, you to know that. you can't. Yeah. Yes. So they shared that as well. So, and I've been for lunch with um, Michael Knowles and his wife. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty well, sure. Well, and they're selling your t-shirt. I mean, that was like a, a bit much for me to say the least. I was like, because I I don't, I probably realized that that was happening later. I don't know when that started, but I think I saw it last week and was like, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this on, is though. a bit much. That's a bit, you are really, really taking the mickey now. Um, um, but, you know, it is okay. I think we just need to eclipse the man. That's what we need to do. Sure. I mean, that's you're you're right. I mean, all the complaining. I couldn't help but complain because I was so angry. Um, but uh, I think you're right. It's like the doing the work is what's important, not complaining about Matt Walsh. Um, uh, and... we can still do that. It's fun. <laughs> you gotta complain to somebody. You can't just keep it all inside. It's what am I gonna complain to my boyfriend about Matt Walsh? He doesn't know who Matt Walsh is. No. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I did, I almost cried <laughs> when it first started. I was so angry that I was, he was like, I don't think I've ever seen you so upset. Cause I just, it all just like the, it's like everything that I've gone through, <laughs> like, um, uh, TPS says the other side of this is that the left needs normies to think that only religious white men are against gender theory, which is totally true. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, that's why the mainstream media in Canada and the CBC, for example, wouldn't ever interview me or, you know, acknowledge that there's feminists who were fighting this issue because it would interrupt their narrative, which is that only the, these conservative right wing religious bigots disagree with that because they're also homophobic and that there's yeah. no valid, there's no valid critique coming from the left or, you know, just coming from regular apolitical people. Yeah. You've missed a chat, by the way, that's really high up. From okay. Um, at uh, 916. Oh, the Tavistock. Yes. Right. Yes. I saw that news today too. Um, I think this is amazing. I think this is like a really big deal, which is that they, they just announced that they shut down the Tavistock gender clinic because essentially it's, unethical yeah it's unsafe for kids um now i think there's two ways that trans activists are somehow celebrating this um i don't think they they're know. celebrating this yeah because that what they've said is that care is going to go into the regions so then you will have regional places to access uh gender identity nonsense now i think the tavistock closing is absolutely symbolic and i think it will have a really good message for maybe people who haven't thought about this issue very much or kind of heard about the tavistock and know what it's for and now they'll hear that it's shutting because it's not safe what will also happen when you take this out to the regions is they will find ways of managing their finances so they will have a finite amount of money and they will have to decide um whether to spend money on a little bit of counselling or whether to spend it on um, uh, like women with breast cancer or elderly care or whatever it is, but it will be a finite resource. And I think when you take it local, um, I think it will just completely transform it. I think that's what the government's really doing. They don't want to just say, we're going to just stop dead. We disagree with all of it. We think the whole idea, concept of a trans child is preposterous, evil. Um, but they can say, we're going to take it out to the regions and they can restructure the whole thing there mm. so that there's, there's going to be no kid in the UK under 16 on puberty blockers. And I would hope there won't be any under 18s on anything that at all changes their medical um, or, you know, their, their bodies in any mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, this just, this signals that people are being forced to address the fact that this is enormously unethical and that yeah. there is huge, lifelong devastating impacts on kids bodies and health and lives when 
they do this and that kids are being pushed into this and that kids cannot consent to these kinds of procedures. They don't understand the implications of going on puberty blockers and hormones and how it'll impact their reproductive futures and their ability to enjoy sex and, and many other things as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Sean says, I seriously cannot believe the whole map phenomenon. No one would ever accept child rape. No one would ever accept child rape attracted person as an orientation, but it's literally that. Thanks for sending up to this insanity. Um, I have, Nicole says, Matt Walsh is a thief. Megan is the OG. Thank you. Posey too. Uh, <laughs> I have a couple questions from Patreon that I'm going to get to, and then I'll let you go. Um, so Joe says, I'd like to hear whatever predictions KJ can make about how her Speaker's Corner Brighton event would go. I don't know about this event. Um, I think she said she already had nearly 400 attendees expected. That's probably the biggest mobilization of turfs ever, right? Does she and do you think that the sheer numbers might force a shift in popular narrative? If not, what number will? Um, and yeah, I'm going to just end that there. What's the Speaker's Corner Brighton event? Okay. So I do every month, I do a Speaker's Corner in London at Speaker's Corner. Um, and we invite everybody to come along. There's no hierarchy. You don't book to speak. Um, and anybody can speak. And so we've been doing these for quite a long time now. And then we decided that some women couldn't make it. So we started touring the country. So we've done, we did Bristol last. Um, and they are super woke and they came out to protest. Um, we did Manchester, they protested. There's TRAs protesting. Bristol was particularly great, really good optics. You've got that most of the men uh, against us look like just straight men, normal men, just nasty. Um, and I'm little, and so they're all surrounding me, <laughs> calling me names anyway. Brighton, obviously, the capital of wokeness and LGB. T, very T wokeness. Um, and we're going there for a public event. Uh, and I hope the TRAs come out in force because they just make us look amazing. So we put an event right up so we can get some sort of idea about security um, because some people are frightened. I I am not frightened by these men. I, I invite their bad behavior. I think it's fantastic for us. Um, I'm terrified of them. I'm impressed that you're not scared. I won't do an event without private bodyguards because I think somebody's going to kill me, actually. But we live in the UK where people don't have weapons. Oh, okay. So it would be, you know, maybe if I lived in America, I would have a different idea about the concept of violence and my own personal safety. Um, but look, we're going to get female-only security for Brighton uh, because people are worried so we're going to get female insecurity because they're much better at de-escalating. Um, I think the TRAs will come out in force. I, what's interesting is a lot of people that are writing to me to say they're coming are gay men and lesbian women mm. um, and slightly older. So these will be people that actually marched against Section 28, like really had proper uh, gay rights fights um, and protests. And so they're coming as well because they are a pig sick of straight men taking over their community. So I think it's going to be epic. If anybody is in the UK, if you want to come, it's on the 18th of September. Um, and if you join up to the Eventbrite, then you can find out exactly where we're going to be. But nothing is hidden. It's all completely public. This is awesome. Where's the link to the Eventbrite? Is it on your YouTube um, somewhere where I can post it in the, the comments or anything like that. Probably. Let me, uh, I can post it in the comments. Let me just... Okay, cool. Um, Leslie says, don't always agree with KJ, but she does care for women. Well, Ooh. I do. Uh, nobody always agrees with anybody. I think that's fine. Yeah, it's silly to think that you would. And wouldn't that be boring? Um, there's another question from Patreon. Um I'm going to put this in the private chat, Megan. Uh, 
I'm sort of confused. Lordy, another suspended Twitter account surprise. I think she must be talking about the Standing for Women account. Is that right? Oh, I don't know. Uh, based on her experience with this draconian monitoring by law enforcement, I would all, I would be interested to know how her test case is going and how it is already impacting public discourse. Also, how important. Also, how is it impacting her family and support system? Does this make sense to you? No, I don't have a test case. Um, Let me just look. Let's see if there is more to this question. Is this from or, your question? Yes. Okay. Let's give me a moment here. Um, anyway, everyone, we're going to sign off fairly soon. So if you do have any more quick questions, please use the super chat so that I see it. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I'm not sure what the test case means um somebody I mean, put four four and a half thousand twitter accounts cancelled uh list yes where find uh and then put someone put i can't believe scott nugent got banned i don't oh. know um the other part of her question was um are we normalizing the mutilation of children for lar large sums of money no less what might the psychological ramifications be, say, 15 years from now, as these trans people become adults? What happens if they can't afford ongoing treatment? Does it become the government's responsibility to sustain their transgenderness? Look, I think the mutilation of children that is is I think that's quite easy for us to see the barbarism and, and how that will play out. And I think that the um when those kids when those kids actually do if they can reach adulthood because if they have these puberty blockers and then they don't get to go through puberty i don't know what the psychological damage is to be like an adolescent forever because you don't actually your brain doesn't make these changes i don't think we have any idea what we're doing at all i think it's very scary um but i think actually for the whole of that generation the gaslighting and the lies and the and the told to, you know, these kids are basically saying, do not say what you can see in front of you. That sort of level of harm on such a vast number of children and young people, I wonder what the ramifications will be as for us as a society as a whole. Because there will be those that have stayed silent. Um and will be very, very angry because they won't have believed it all along, but they couldn't say it. There'll be those that have been admonished and excluded from parts of friendship groups and so on because they did speak up. And then there'll be those that, that were dishonestly pulled into it. And none of those things are good. It's just scary as hell. Yeah. Um, I posted the link to your event right in the live chat. Um, I'll post it down in the show notes of this video once we're done. Um, Liam says, I am not violent, but this tests me as a father of a daughter. This is existential for her. In France, we are less tolerant of the abuse of women. Straight men need to stand up to protect LGB rights and women. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, th I think it's, it's the truth. It's the fundamental basis upon which uh, we can thrive as as human beings and that is being attacked so it's you you know as a straight man you can just stand up and defend yourself and your sanity um as well as your um any women or females you're connected to or lgb people but quite honestly the the attack on truth is is so fundamental it's existential for all of us yeah um I'm going to let you go. I know that it's late for you. Thank you so much for joining us today and talking about all of these things. Um, I hope you're selling lots of t-shirts on Instagram. I said everyone should buy your t-shirt instead of the Daily Wire one because yours is better. But also, give me a fucking break with this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone, for Thank the super so chats. Uh, they limited the ads on this video is they limit all the ads on all my videos so i'm not able to really make much money on youtube um but uh 
yeah, let's we'll we'll be in touch soon. I'm sure it was great to see you and talk to you. You look lovely as always. Oh. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming. Um, like and subscribe. Blah 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 blah. Okay. Bye. I'm staying.